Welcome to Rooted Cosmic Soul. Thank you for joining this journey in which we will explore transmuting the eye. This is broken down into three parts. Part one, unbinding identity, context, and background. Part two, unbinding identity, the yang of it. And part three, unbinding identity, the yin of it. Given the length of this episode, I've added timestamps. You'll find those in the description. I do recommend listening to watching the totality of the episode because they all work well together, but you could definitely only engage the yang of it and get something out of it or only engage the yin of it and get something out of it, in in my opinion. So thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to share this with you. Let's jump in. Let's start with how I defined this idea, practice concept of transmuting the I. Transmuting the I is the practice of changing, altering, and lifting the veil on external and internal exertion of oppression, suppression, and control on one's 3D experience. So like the material world, your everyday particularly interactions with others and and the self. Um, And the act of transmuting that is then you, once you are changing, altering, or lifting that veil, you then release your energy from it. Uh, In this case, we unbind a particular energy uh, and then allows us to engage in a 5D perception and reality. Or you could just think of it more of like your true, authentic, divine self. So we transmute some of the energies that are hindering us from actually moving in this world uh, as our authentic selves. Transmuting the I videos are for those who are interested in growth, right? Who have an understanding that uh, we come into this world with lessons to learn and things to understand and shifts to make, whether that's, you know, for our own progression or, or karma, um, and, or because of agreements we made with, um, lineage and ancestors and work that we've agreed to do to come in and attempt to help ourselves and, um, our lineage or, and, or the world heal. That's who these videos are for, for people who are already there, who you understand that as part of your reality. And, um, I've believed that for a really long time, but a lot of the things that were given to me, um, weren't tangible enough for me and then also weren't spiritual enough for me. And so that's why I started thinking about transmuting the I as in my I, my being, and also I, as in my third eye, my spiritual experience of, of this reality. And so that's who these videos are for. If that resonates for you, awesome. If it doesn't, maybe stick around and maybe it will. (laughs) And if it absolutely doesn't, you're not even here. So why am I talking to you? (laughs) Today, I'm going to be sharing thoughts on how to transmute identity. Um, And before I get into the yin and yang of it, let me first like clarify when I speak about identity, what I'm talking about and what I'm not talking about. What I'm not talking about is um, unbinding identity in the sense of we're trying to move toward the belief systems or people who say, I don't see race. I don't see gender. I don't see sexuality. I don't see class. I just see the human race. I have compassion and grace for people who have that perspective, but it's so far from my own. I, I think that that's uh, disrespectful. I think that that's dismissive of the person who is with you, um, because of the reality we're in. If we were in a different reality, I might be able to get down with that thought, but that's, <laughs> that's not the reality I'm experiencing. So, um, uh, this is, I'm not speaking about unbinding the identity to completely, uh, dismiss the importance of identity or to tell people to, you know, um, 
not have an identity or not be proud of your various identities. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is um, given the context of the system that we're in, there is a lot about particular identities, which I'll get into in a moment, um, that is used. There's, there's a way in which particular identities are used to oppress, suppress, and control ourself. And it's an external force. It's also an internal force because of um, generational trauma, because of centuries, millennia of an overculture attempting to suppress and suppress, oppress, and control people for their own gain. Um, and so I'm talking about unbinding the ways in which identity does that, 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 um, engaging with our identity is actually not helping us. Uh, it's moving us further away from our authentic self, as opposed to moving closer to and sitting in one's authentic self. That's the part of identity that, that we're going to talk about today. And that, um, I continue to do a lot of work to unbind. The best way to engage this content is to take what works, right? And leave what doesn't work for others, for the people that it will work for. Because given that we're talking about identity, the possibilities and perspectives are infinite. And I'm just one person. I'm offering considerations based on my reality of the world, my experience. Um, I do run a consulting firm, so I do engage with, with different people. And to be honest, like, you know, um, like attracts like, so a lot of my clients, uh, are more similar to me than dissimilar, even if we don't share particular identities. So obviously my perspective is, is not full force. Like I'm not out here hanging out with skinheads, asking them to unpack their identity as skinheads. (laughs) Somebody's doing that work and thank the God is for you. That's not me. Right. I work primarily with, um, you know, with folks who already have an understanding why supremacy exists, patriarchy exists, homophobia is real, you know, xenophobia is real, um, folks who want to do less harm in the world and are looking for, um, tools, ideas, concepts that can help them be less harmful to themselves and to others. Uh, that's the perspective that I generally work with. So that's what you're going to get here take what works again, leave what doesn't. Because the way that I do the transmuting the I episodes is I start with the yang, um, the more mental, logical, thought-based, strategic thinking, problem-solving kind of way of thinking about unbinding and transmuting, really transmuting and unbinding. Um, And then And then I move into the yin, which is the more intuitive spiritual in which we will pull some Oracle cards and have a conversation about it via spirit, ancestors, angels in the light and, and go from there. So watch all of it, none of it, some of it, (laughs) whatever works for you. But this is what works for me. I have found that being in balance between my head and my heart, while, um, my, head is the servant of my heart, but there is a balance. I'm, I'm being, um, intuitive and logical and, you know, I'm being slow, um, and thoughtful. Um, I'm allowing emotions to come in and, uh, logic, uh, and, and weighing all of it and just seeing what, what works for me as I transmute this really harmful, weird, chaotic (laughs) reality that, uh, we seem to be in, but luckily moving away from. Let me first talk about like why transmute the eye, um, and unbind identity in particular. Uh, the reason that I want to do this one is just work that I've been doing because I, my soul chose a reality in which I have multiple identities that can sometimes be considered to be in contradiction to each other or, um, you know, one could position them as a duality, but I see them as a polarity. Like they're kind of, they're not mutually exclusive and they're on a spectrum of, of, of experience, but that's because of the overculture, which is what we're going to talk about. So the unbinding for me becomes really important to get to an authentic self, to have a clarity as to what I'm taking on that 
is not mine and I don't want what I'm taking on is mine. And I want like in the myriad of ways in which I could say that sentence of like getting clarity for myself of who I am, because this moves me closer to, um, it supports getting to my authentic self, right? Getting to an authentic self that supports realizing choice and actualizing free will. My perspective of the world is that is the best way to break constructs of oppression, suppression, and control. Because when it keeps us in this idea that choice doesn't exist or free will is not an actual thing, it's much easier to control us. And it's much easier to control what we see, how we think, what we feel. So when we start unbinding that, uh, when we start unbinding our identity, we start unbinding other layers of bullshit from um, the overculture of uh, suppression, oppression, control. Some people call it white supremacy, patriarchy, homophobia, xenophobia, classism, sexism, right? The isms and the obias galore. Um, they're essentially oppression, suppression, and control. It's somebody or something trying to tell you what is right or not right, what is good and what is bad, and etc. So um, I do believe that living one's true authentic self is 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 about as a, a fuck you <laughs> to the system of oppression, suppression, and control one could offer, right? Because if I know myself, um, not just believe in myself, we do a lot of work, like believe in yourself, believe in yourself. Yes, 100% and knowing myself means I know it means it's going to start, that knowing starts impacting um, my flow of energy and the way that I move. Because if I know something, I'm moving that way. Sometimes I might believe something, but I've got some hidden limiting beliefs and we'll do unbinding limiting beliefs in another video. But um, I might have some, some layered limiting beliefs that are deep, 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 deep. Um, and that's the work. Like part of unbinding identity is to get to those lower layers so that I can release them and, and, uh, be in the flow of knowing. Um, cause if I flow and move in that energy of great self knowing, then those systems can't influence and impact me. Those systems will still be active externally, but they'll hold less and less power, uh, to oppress and suppress me internally, which then my external reality starts shifting. When I started thinking about this idea of unbinding the identity, I want to acknowledge, it feels really important for me to say that this comes from um, a framework that I learned about years ago and is part of a course that um, I offer along with my business partner called Cultivating Intersectional Leadership. We incorporated a framework called Social Constructs of Dynamics Diversity. It's a mouthful, <laughs> but it's really, it really has helped me, um, remember my power. Uh, and it's based on 15 categories that have systemically targeted one group of people over another. And it's, it's based on a historical and current power dynamic in which these 15 identities get used to target w uh, one group over another. It's, it's, it's really a beautiful example of duality in our system and using duality to pin us against each other, to, um, to force us to think in a, in terms of scarcity, hierarchy, competition, etc. Um, and so at, on this duality, there's the, there's the end of the poll that is about people who utterly get targeted. And then there, the other end is people who, do not get targeted at all. And then there's a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum moving between these two. The 15 social constructs of dynamics diversity that um, Dr. Juan Carlos Arauz spoke about are race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, language, age when one is old, older, age when one is young, younger, class, ability, marital status and family status, uh, body size, so height and weight, religion, nationality, gender, education, assigned sex category, 
uh, and environment and geography. Now, yes, you might be one of those people who is like, there's so many more identities that I identify more. I'm bigger than that. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I'm talking about very specific identities that systems of oppression, suppression, and control specifically use to oppress, suppress, and control. So that's these. When I started thinking about unbinding identity, I started thinking about in terms of the dynamics of identity. So when I first started thinking about this concept of the social construct, it very much was from this place of a force that's being exerted on me, which is real. But it was only half of the journey. What I realized was that there was a lot that I had internalized around uh, these forces that I was now um, exerting on myself. And so the dynamics of identity come into play when I start thinking about my authentic self and who I want to be in the world for, um, for my own growth, but for, to be a part of, uh, the growth and betterment, the greater good of all. When I'm speaking about unbinding and transmuting, um, I'm really talking about like excavating and exploring those internalized energies, thoughts, beliefs, past generation survival needs, any false premises um, that are sitting in me because of a particular identity, a way in which I had to be that worked at some point that doesn't really work for me anymore. I'm also really talking about Western culture perspective here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm filming this, uh, from the United States, born and raised in the United States. Uh, I have traveled internationally, but not very much. So like, it's very much, uh, a Western perspective. I'm coming from a person who was born and raised in the United States, born on the East coast, mostly raised there, then came of age on the West coast. Now occasionally lives in the Southwest. <laughs> like, so there's so much stuff that's very much about the experience here, uh, of colonialism, imperialism, uh, enslavement of U S reality. Um, so, you know, this is a learning, even if you're, if you're watching this from another country or culture, take what works, leave what doesn't right? Use my experiences and what I'm sharing as your roadmap to, uh, unbind your identity for yourself. Still, it still can be useful to you. The other thing to think about is like, as we start thinking about these dynamics of identity, um, is this idea of internalized superiority and internalized inferiority. So again, when I was talking about the, the duality of these identities, 15 social constructs, um, race, right? So in race, there's, uh, the absolute end in Western culture is to simplify it. White people, black people. And then there's people who are mixed race or other races, uh, that, you know, look more like the white or more like the black or, uh, 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 along these, along this pole. And what this, this, uh, polarity, this duality does is that it positions white as superior and black as inferior. And for so long, this has been the reality of the way the framing has been set for, for Western culture that we start internalizing ideas of a superiority for the white folks over here and inferiority for the, for the black folks over here and a spectrum of that, depending on where you might land, if you don't feel like you're at, you know, either end. And at this point, Really, if someone sat down with identity in terms of race and ethnicity, no one's really at the end of the, well, I shouldn't say no one because I don't know the entire world, but many of us, in, you know, within the U.S. culture, we're somewhere along the spectrum because our people have been mixing and mingling for quite a while. Um, now, mind you, it's really easy when we start getting into race. It can seem easy when we're in race to just think, well, if I'm white, I've got, you know, internalized superiority and that's it. Well, then you want to layer in their education, 
right? Did you go to college? And in our society, the elitism of our society, education, one end is educated, not educated, right? And I'm simplifying it, but those of us who have multiple degrees, especially in higher institutions of learning in the United States, we've been taught to an internalized superiority to people who have not. People either um, just didn't go to college or in trades or musicians. Like, yeah, it's great. You do what you do, but you're not as smart as we are. And therefore we make the rules. We do this. Listen to us. We're paternalistic. We make, you know, we're the decision makers because you don't have an education, right? So it can... When your identity gets layered, there's all these different ways in which we internalize superiority and inferiority. And that's one, that's another main reason I like to unbind, do the work of unbinding identity. Because my goal is to do less harm to myself and to others in that order. Uh, And so it becomes really important to understand my I. Because not only the more I understand my I, the more I'm less likely to harm myself. But in understanding my I, when I'm out in the world, when I'm in the we, I have a clear understanding of how I am moving, how my I is impacting the world. And I have more choice and free will to make sure that it's not harming or it's harming less. Right now, that could be people, place, planet. So that's the dynamics of identity. That's what we're working with. We're going to jump into the yang of it. So the yang of it, when I say the yang of it, I'm talking about reason, mind, and thought focused transmuting, right? And by the yang, I'm using, um, characteristics such as logic, reason, rationality, strategy, planning, future oriented goals, solution-based thinking, problem solving, decision making. Uh, I'm pursuing a linear course. I see where I am. I know where I want to be when I get over there, right? Um, thinking, intellect, controlling and pursuing. It's a course. I've mapped it out. We're going to, I'm going to control as much as I can to get over there, right? Um, might even be, it might be helpful if I did this with a friend and we talked about it together and we compare, like maybe with a sibling because you have similar uh, experiences or identities that really overlap, make it a competition, get a little bit of ambition going on in there. You know, who could peel back? who could find the inner child the quickest kind of thing. Um, And then it's a singularity of purpose and direction, right? We're not really thinking spiral. We're not thinking circle. We're thinking straight line. Let's get over there, right? That's uh, the, the, what is also termed masculine energy. I tend to use the term yang because our Western culture has completely and utterly fucked us up when it comes to using the words masculine, feminine. And clearly irritated by it. That's definitely going to be an episode, but, um, I need to do some personal unbinding (laughs) first in my irritation of humans around the topic, uh, before, but, um, so masculine energy is action and directional action and directional. It's the doing aspect. We're doing it. We're in action. So using the arts of introspection and self-awareness, right? So transmuting, you want action oriented, doing aspects. So being in the doing of introspection and self-awareness, uh, there's some opening prompts I would offer you to explore to begin with deepening, unbinding your identity. So the first one is, uh, who is my I? Who is my I? So this is for you. You're in the I and like, really, who is my I? So you could start thinking about this in terms of just topically, like who, who is, who you believe you are, um, who you sense other people think you are. Um, I mean, an example of that is like, I know that, um, you know, there's a way in which my survival, um, given my childhood and then my, identity, my racial identity, the visual of me, um, there's a way in which people believe my eye is quite hard, (laughs) uh, and tough. And in some ways I can be, but mostly, 
Um, I'm a big teddy bear. Like I'm, I'm all about love and it's taken me a really long time to even realize that or get there. And that's not to say hard people are not loving. That's not what I mean. But I think that there's a, a way in which there's an idea that, um, I, you know, the, our assumptions that we make about what we believe a hard person needs or, um, how they move is one in which they don't need tenderness or they, um, don't move with loving kindness or thoughts. Right. So that's the, that's that work of like, who is my I? So I have, I've done and will continue to do work about really naming myself for me and the places where I have allowed other people to name me to start figuring out why. Um, and, and often it's cause at some point it worked, <laughs> some point it worked for me and now it's not working, you know, and if it's not working, what do I need to do to release that? By prompt, I'm talking about like, this could be journaling, this could be dancing it out, this could be um, audio recording it, you know, talking to yourself, it could be drawing, uh, playing an instrument, sitting in quiet contemplation, uh, talking to your therapist, like there's all kinds of different ways, you know, sky's the limit on how you want to do this. I suggest if you want to explore to begin or deepen your unbinding your identity to just do it right. Who is my I? The second prompt is who do I believe I am? So starting to really look at the ways in which, um, I have a belief that I am a particular person, right? I believe I'm a good listener. And then I want to start looking at my actions in and uh, how are my actions in and out of alignment with these beliefs? So sometimes with my clients, I do feel like I talk too much, but because especially as I'm growing now, I get so many messages. It's really hard to slow them down, but you know, it means for me, it's like, I want to look at like, well, I believe I have a, a, you know, I'm a really good listener. So how are my actions aligned or not aligned? And what do I want to do about that? Right. So sometimes I'm binding could just be being in a conversation with my higher self, with my, with my 3d self of like, before I get on a call with a client of like, really let reminding myself, I want to just listen or, um, you know, or if I am, if I'm feeling like I'm getting a lot of messages and the client really needs that, then ask, letting them know that, right. Being really transparent and vulnerable. Um, because unbinding the idea that since I'm the consultant, I need to know everything and dictate everything is not really who I am and not the identity that I want to be a part of. So unbinding, it means being transparent and vulnerable with my client and saying, here's what I'm at. Here's what I'm thinking and making the offering. Would you like to hear this? Okay. So the third prompt is how is my eye framed or influenced by the we I'm in? So sometimes the, my concept of myself is being dictated or influenced, um, and no judgment, right? You might want it to be. The thing is you want to be clear that it's a choice, right? That it's being dictated by the group I'm in, right? I'm at work. How do work people see me? Is that my identity? Is that influencing my identity? Does that work for me? Does it not work for me? Family, partners, pets, convenience store, grocery store, driving down the road, you know, in your car, all different ways that our ways of being can get influenced by the world around me. Sorry. I just almost freaked out because I thought maybe the camera wasn't recording, but my system wasn't recording, but it's recording. Um, and so these three prompts can be really helpful in the initial process, right? So using the arts of introspection and self-awareness, very tangible things. Um, it becomes really important to additional tools, transparency and vulnerability with the self. As you're going through these prompts, if you really want to do this for real, for reals, um, you're going to need to be transparent and vulnerable with yourself. Um, because getting to these truths about the self means you have to confront some things that you may not, um, really want to admit to yourself about parts of your identity that are not working for you. Um, and so I like to think of it as like, I'm confronting a particular bind, but for me, confrontation, particularly, this is where, you know, it's shadow work. Um, I'm calling in a part of me 
that created this way of being and influenced my identity in some way um, that probably was likely to protect me. And it worked at some point, but it, I don't need it anymore. It doesn't work or um, it's harmful to me, right? So it's time to heal it um, and take the wheel back. I like to think about like, there's all these different parts of me that I'm um transmuting, they're basically parts of me that created themselves to keep me safe. And now as I get greater clarity and get more back to my authentic self and not having to be in full protection and fear mode, calling them in of like, you don't have to disappear because they're part of us, right? Like it's part of me. Little baby Deidre is part of Deidre. 50-year-old grown-ass Deidre. <laughs> I don't want to get rid of baby Deidre, but baby Deidre can't take the wheel anymore, right? It didn't work. It worked when I had no agency, but I have agency now. I have, a, you know, I have access. I have resources now. So you got to slow your roll, baby Deidre, and give me the wheel back, and we're going to take, we're going to take this ride together, you know? And, and if and when you feel like I need your resources because something has occurred. Let's be in conversation, <laughs> right? But you don't get to dictate. You don't need, you don't get to oppress, suppress, and control my free will. Okay. Other tools to really keep in mind when we're doing this, like I'm making light of it. And sometimes it, I am because like, I'm on the other side of a lot of identity work and I'm in joy. Um, you know, when I was, it, when I was a teenager, um, my father has passed away. My father and is black. My family is black American. Um, my mother's side of the family is Puerto Rican in New York. Puerto Rican is basically black. When I was a kid nowadays, it feels like you're not allowed to say that, which I don't really understand, but that was our reality. Like, you know, I'm Puerto Rican. We came from, you know, we just got dropped off from the slave trade with, you know, European slave trade before y'all, um, we're the same people. Uh, but anyway, um, I wasn't black enough I wasn't Puerto Rican enough and I had nowhere, I had nowhere to go in that. And I really struggled with identity in the sense of, you know, it, it really, my worthiness really took a hit and then it starts influencing my identity in other ways of just being secure in who I am. And now I'm on the other side of that, you know, like I'm black, I'm Puerto Rican, any black person, any Puerto Rican person, disagrees with how I'm being and trying to tell me I'm not black enough, not Puerto Rican enough, <laughs> take yourself out. Cause I, I don't, I just laugh because I'm like, who are you to tell me what I, you know, who I am or how I am to be. Um, and so that's why I laugh about it. But the journey there, there was a lot of sadness, a lot of crying. Um, uh, another example is, um, gender presentation, sexual orientation. In in the early 2000s, I lived in the Bay Area. I identify as a cis woman. I'm lesbian. I've always been. Um, and at that, in that era, early 2000, mid, early 2000s, aughts, 2000s, um, I kind of peripherally hung out with a crowd of folks who started, um, who were cis women as well and started using he, him, his pronouns, um, which... I, I was like, cool. That's what you want to do. Like for me, that's never been an issue. I'm like, I don't really care. Like it's your identity. I'll call you what you want. Um, but they started telling me that I hated myself because given the way that I looked and that as a cis woman, I, I, I wore mostly clothes made for men. Um, I walked in a more masculine way from their percent perspective. I dated women who, who were traditionally a bit more feminine, a lot more feminine, um, than me that I hated myself for not being called he, for not taking on he, him, his pronouns. Um, and it was tough. Like it was really, um, there was only, uh, there was a moment where I questioned myself, but then I just, I, I love being a woman. I love being a cis woman. I don't think, I don't think the clothes I wear or the haircut, um, or whether I cross my legs in a certain way determines my connection to my divinity, my divine feminine. Right. And like, or my masculinity, like for me, it's a balance thing. And, but that's what I'm talking about when I say we want to be really careful, not only about my I, 
when I'm unbinding identity for myself, but also how am I impacting the world? Because I experienced those folks saying those things to me as harm. It was harmful. It made me sad. It made me feel disconnected, I, I, unbelonging. Um, I lacked belonging to a community that was supposed to like embrace diversity. <laughs> I mean, so I know that if you're in the thick of it, it can be rough. It can be tough. Um, and I will continue to say it takes courage and strength to lean on and seek support from others. So if you need support as you're going through this and you're unbinding the bullshit that other people are trying to put on you or the bullshit you've put on yourself, get that support. I'm on the other side of a lot of this and it's freeing. And that's why I'm sharing this video. And I want people to um, have an opportunity to know what I know because I don't give a fuck whether you think I'm, <laughs> you, want, you think I should be he, she, they, them. Like I fully respect whatever it is you want to be. I'm going to be me period. And I keep it moving. Right. That's unbinding. That's what I'm binding identity looks like. So it's the both end. I get to be my own identity and I hold space for you to be yours. As long as yours doesn't harm me, <laughs> you're not dictating to me what I'm supposed to be. So as you're doing that, hold a lot of grace and compassion for where you are. Take a lot of breaths, breathe a lot. Um, I used to get shit from partners cause I would, uh, sigh and exhale a lot in my relationships, but yeah, I had a lot of healing to do in a lot of my relationships. And the only way I could process some of the stuff that was coming up for me, cause I couldn't I had no connection to my throat chakra. I couldn't really express to them what was happening for me. Um, I could only sigh. I could only breathe. And if that's all you got on it, then that's what you got on it. The rest will come if you, you know, intentionally walk the journey. Um, and so look for what works and what does not work for you, especially when you're going through these different identities, the specific identities of who I am, what's influenced me, what works and what doesn't work for you. And sometimes there's things from generational, generationally that, um, you know, black folks needed to be and do my dad's family needed to be and do 200 years ago that I don't need to be and do, but it's still in me epigenetics y'all epigenetics. So I need to have a conversation with that part of me of like, again, I'm not trying to throw out the beauty that is, uh, generational pieces of me, but you don't get to take the wheel right? That's the idea is that with every generation we grow and expand. So let me grow and expand inner, inner pieces. So a tangible strategic goal when it comes to unbinding identity, understand the following aspects of the over culture in Western and mostly in Western cultures, but you know, uh, also cultures globally that have been imperial have uh, experienced imperialism, colonialism from Western cultures. And that is rugged individualism. Um, so really look at your relationship to this, um, the eye of the eye. Like I do a lot of work around prioritizing the internal work of the eye, but I'm doing that in terms of to get to the most authentic eye and to help us be in the world in a way that creates less harm. Cause the more authentic I am, I believe the less harmful I am. Um, and so rugged individualism is this idea is I just get to be my eye as I get to be my eye. Fuck everybody else. <laughs> you know, like, no, um, from this perspective, when we're really trying to move from, um, doing less harm and a holistic self, that's not, that's not what we're looking at. There is an impact of your eye. Um, and so get an understanding of your understanding of that term and what that means. You can Google it. There's all kinds of stuff out there in the world around. It's usually listed as white supremacy characteristic. Um, so you can figure out different ways of um, unpacking that for yourself. Uh, the other thing is aesthetics. So aesthetics, how I see the world, how I've been told to see the world is going to impact my identity and how I see others. So like aesthetically, what I was just talking about, how people came sideways at me when I was in my um, late twenties, early thirties around needing to be a he, because their perception of me was uh, masculine. Um, that's influence. Like th that's a very toxic masculine view, <laughs> but having an understanding of how is that, how are those things impacting my eye, how I'm seeing myself and how I'm seeing others. 
And then the third place is communication and assumptive engaging. So this is more about unbinding identity on how you are engaging others, engaging people in the world. Um, in a workplace situation, there are um, assumptions that we will make about certain people and then it impact about their identity, my, our perspective of their identity, how they're presenting themselves and then communicate in that way, as opposed to being curious and being in conversation. So for example, seeing someone's identity as the angry black woman and assuming that's who they are and then communicating with them in that manner. Um, um, entitled racist old white man, um, entitled annoying, crying white woman, entitled, it's a lot of, you know, this is America. So a lot of entitlement entitled know-it-all Gen Zer, right. Who, um, who doesn't want to listen just wants to do. Um, I'm using them as examples of the things that we say in our mind, we make up about other people's identities. And then we communicate with them based on that bullshit that we have in our mind that was given to us by a system that attempts to suppress, oppress, and control us. And the ways that it does it is to disconnect us from each other, disconnect us from ourselves and disconnect us from each other. And so there's a tangible goal to look at your relationship to rugged individualism. How are you moving in the world? What is your eye like? Aesthetics, having an understanding of your own eye and the we based on what you see and what you've been told is superior, inferior, uh, and communication, assumptive engaging. When am I not being curious? When am I not simply asking a question? When am I moving from a place of um, assumption and stereotype and disregard uh, in my communication with someone based on my perception of their identity. These mind and thought considerations are just a start. There's so, there's so much here. I'm looking at the time I've went over way, way longer than I thought I would on this video thus far. So there, I mean, there's more and there's so much more. So, um, remember that transmuting the eye is a journey. It's got many paths, you know, um, and in each, there's lots of opinions, there's lots of layers, uh, there's lots of beauty and truth and um, uh, lies <laughs> to explore. And it's up to you to discern and determine your next choice, your next steps, what you keep, what you don't keep, what works, what doesn't work, where you're going. Okay, now let's get into the yin of it, right? The heart, intuition, and feeling focus transmuting. Uh, by the yin of it, I'm you, I'm meaning by this, I mean, and I'm using characteristics such as emotions and feelings, intuitive, non-rational awareness, flowing cyclical and spiral processes, allowing and accepting, trusting natural outcomes, being just being an inner stillness, relationship and connection, listening to subtle methods of communication, such as the heart, the spirit, and your inner voice of truth. Uh, the yin is also considered feminine energy. If you watched, um, if you watch the yang of it, you know, that I mentioned there that I tend to not use the words feminine and masculine because our society has really, um, manipulated and misunderstood these concepts, uh, quite like patriarchy did it. Um, patriarchy has manipulated, uh, and, and caused us to misunderstand these energies in, uh, really detrimental ways. And so, uh, that's what I'm talking about. The yin of it is the feminine energy here. The recepts, the, uh, it's reception and organic. It's the being aspect, right? So it's counterpart is, um, the doing aspect, masculine energy, feminine energy is the being aspect. This has nothing to do with, um, one's gender or one's sex. It has to do with energy. So you can be any gender, any sex or non-binary and move in, exhibit, hold, explore, grow masculine and or feminine energy. They're energies. <laughs> okay. Um, even, you know, animals, 
the planet, the elements move in different uh, aspects of these energies in different ways, all to seek balance and harmony of, of existence. The yin of it, heart intuition and focus and feeling focused transmuting. What we're going to do is we're going to use some transmuting the eye oracle cards made by yours truly. Um, and I've already shuffled. We're going to pull from these cards and um, the, the transmuting the eye deck that I created as well as a couple of others. But I did already shuffle all of them and sat with the idea and energy of this episode uh for this particular episode this idea of unbinding identity i created um well i'm using a spread that i created for transmuting called journeys and intentions and it's a three card spread um and so let me just drop in here for a moment because I did, did already pray and ask for higher selves, ancestors, spirit guides, and angels in the light to be with us here. And the Yang of it reading um, conversation took longer than I thought. So let me just move this deck and drop in here for a moment. We're going to pull three cards for whoever is here, for the energies that have arrived. Spirit, ancestors, angels, archangels, you know who has arrived. What do they need to hear? What do they need to hear that will be helpful as they walk their unbinding identity journey? Walk the unbinding entity journey. As I mentioned, it's a three card spread. I'm going to take the top three cards. Card number one is where your journey is now. Card number two is an intention to consider. And card number three is uh, how a sign on how to get there. So my oracle cards are designed uh, very similar to a tarot deck, um, whereas the major arcana are called journey cards and the minor arcana are called pathway cards. And for our first card, where your journey is now, we pulled uh, a pathway card. And it's a remembering card. Engage grace and compassion. And the first thing I'm getting from that is um, that you're on the path. You're on the journey, right? Um, and if you watched any of the Yang message, uh, I mentioned there, and it's coming up for me again here, of like, this is tender work. This is work that definitely requires holding, um, engaging a deep level of grace and compassion. And I would say grace and compassion for oneself, uh, particularly as we start unbinding identity, because perhaps you're learning stuff about yourself or seeing stuff for the first time or getting deep into it. Um, and this, this video deepens the journey for you and you're finding stuff that is really difficult to confront or engage. Um, so you want to really hold a lot of grace and compassion for what you're finding for the pace that it's required of you to unbind these pieces of identity, because sometimes the things that we find, they're tough, they're rooted in deep um, for various reasons. And there's no good, uh, bad about this. There's no right or wrong about this. It just is. And sometimes we could know we want to unbind something, And it just feels like no matter what we do, it just, the, the grips, <laughs> the grips of it are so intense that it, there's a return and return and return. And so what I would say is, um, where you are in your journey right now, it's going to be really important to remember to engage grace and compassion 
for yourself first and foremost, uh, and for others. So, cause the other thing that actually just popped up for me is that sometimes when we're in this work and I actually learned this from this, um, there's a really beautiful author, uh, a really beautiful book called boundaries and protections. There's also gold mining, the shadow and the author's name is pixie light horse. And, um, years ago I've used both of those regularly to help me in my early shadow work and my early, uh, finding myself work. Um, and she suggested letting folks, close folks in your life, your closest loved ones, partners, children, parents, um, uh, best friends, like people who are in contact with you a lot to know that you're doing this work, right? So to know that you're walking this journey and that you're doing work to unbind, um, and to hold grace and compassion for them. Because a lot of times the work that we're doing internally, no one else knows, right? And for a lot of us in this time, a lot of us are being, spirit is placing us into um, isolation. And so uh, it, it, it requires, I know, I can say from personal experience, it requires a certain level of grace and compassion for folks who I will speak to who I haven't spoken to for a while, um, and a while ranges from like, you know, three months to three years. Um, and they're interacting with their idea of me, their identity for me. And I'm not there anymore. I'm not that person. And neither, either I never was, and I couldn't tell them, <laughs> right. Or I was because I had some healing to do and I've done the healing and I've released and I've released and I'm not there. And so it requires some grace and compassion for the folks around me that I want to keep in right for the folks who are like, don't get you don't want to get you. And you don't really care. You know, I still would hold grace and compassion for them as a human, but maybe more the tool is to give them the boot. So that's your card. Number one card. Number two that came up was a journey card. Um, and it was, uh, an intention to consider, and it actually came up was thoughtful intentions, thoughtful intentions. Um, and it's actually, let me look up. It's equivalent would be those of you who are, um, those of you who are familiar with the traditional Smith weight tarot process. Um, it's equivalent as the, the emperor card, right? Structure, discipline, the divine masculine. And so an intention to consider is that it's a good time to plan, right? Ready and mindful plan for inspired action. So if you were thinking, maybe you came to this and you're like, Oh, you, you know, did you really spark something in me? And, um, I do want to do this work. Um, it might be good to just have an idea of what's your process. Um, I would stay away from the idea of, uh, a goal, an end goal. I would stay away from that, but you know, you have choice and free will. I would see it more as a spiral and a journey of like, you know, set a plan in place. Like, like maybe it could be that, you know, you want to incorporate this in therapy or you need to find a therapist to actually do this work for some of us, this work, I think for many of us, but I would not have been able to do this work to the extent that I've done it thus far without a really amazing therapist. And I had a really amazing therapist, you know, to the point where we did therapy. And then I finally got to the point where I realized, Oh, we've come to our end. You know, like the work that I want to do is more spirit based, less union, uh, which, you know, Jung based, but it, there's some overlap there, but, um, I would not have been able to do it without therapy. I would not have been able to do it. Um, this, some of this identity work was so somatic for me. It was an embodiment thing. It was so trapped in my body. I would not have been able to do it without massage, you know, therapeutic massage, acupuncture, vitamins. Um, I stopped eating meat for a while. Right. So I think what this is saying is, you know, an intention to consider is to be really thoughtful about this. Um, and to go back to the grace and compassion, that's a way of having grace and compassion for yourself. If you're going to start an unbinding identity journey, have a plan for yourself. Uh, as you go through this process. And the third card is a sign on how to get there, right? So a sign on how to get there. And, um, 
<laughs> we actually pulled the journey card, which uh, it's the equivalent of the chariot card, right? So willpower, uh, journeys, transitions. Uh, so it's a sign on how to get there. It's like it's for you to design your path, right? What what path are you creating, imagining, fostering? And actually goes really well with your previous two cards, um, right? So have a plan. So what is the path? What's the path? What's the plan? Um, take time, hold grace and compassion for yourself. Take time. Time is an illusion. So when I say take time, I mean, breathe, slow down, seek clarity of like, how do you want to do this? And sometimes, um, it might be that you're not doing the totality of you, (laughs) right? In the, in the yang of it, I talked to, I actually, at the very beginning of the video, I talked about the framework, um, the social constructs of dynamics of diversity framework, And those 15, uh, power based identities that this, this, uh, almost said universe. It's not universe. This, uh, over culture uses to oppress, suppress and control. So maybe it's like you start with race and ethnicity, right. And do a little bit work of, 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 of what's the plan? What conversations do I want to have with myself? What books can I read? What conversations can I have with others? Who are the people who I know are thinking about this too? Um, and would be supportive of me, right? Or maybe you're thinking about in terms of a science sex category or class or religion or geography, right? Maybe that's a way to think about the journey. And so, um, the recommendation is a sign on how to get there is to really take uh, the moment to create, imagine, and thoughts to think about what is it, what, what, what do you need to create, imagine, and foster? That is part of the journey, right? It's the part of setting up the, setting up the signposts, <laughs> the ways that will be supportive of you as you unbind your identity. Yes, that's beautiful. Thank you, spirit. All right. Next, I'm going to pull a, um, an archangel chakra oracle card. And what I basically asked the angels was just for, um, energy and chakra that we can, that you can consider leaning into, um, you know, for folks who are present for this heart intuition and feeling focused, transmuting, as you continue to unbind your identity journey, right? So what Archangel Chakra energy can folks lean into or suggestion, a consideration, consideration for those present, consideration for those present. Yeah. All right, I'm going to cut the card three ways. Take the top card. root. (laughs) Not surprising. Not surprising. Ashe. Ashe. Uh, root. All right. So, um, this is what the card says. Express with your body. Dear one, the movement of your body can release tension and stress and open the way for new opportunities to come to you. Today, take a walk or put some music on, and while doing so, allow your body to express whatever arises to let go of tension and stress. Ask me to help, and the energy will move faster. And for those who are interested in the the invocation, this is an Archangel Chakra Oracle deck. It's Archangel, Archangel Gabriel, and the invocation is Archangel Gabriel, as I move my body, please release all tension and stress to open new opportunity to open new opportunities for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So a couple of things I'm getting from this is that you know it could you know for some of us uh, even just the thought of this work can create um, anxiety, tension in the body. So maybe for 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 some folks it's that. Um, to even get to the point where you can create, imagine, and foster the journey, make a plan, you know, a mindful plan for inspired action. Right now, before you even do that, it's 
moving your body or playing some music or whatever it is that works for you to release, um, release that tension is a way to engage grace and action. It says, you know, where's your journey now? It says engage grace and compassion, right? That was the first card. So definitely, um, the other thing that's coming to me right now is like, I, you know, I'm not a big dancer. I, I guess I used to be, but and now as I say that out loud, maybe I, I could engage it more. But um, since it is the root chakra, maybe it's, you know, um, maybe after this you sit and do a meditation. Uh, that's a root chakra based meditation. Um, I have a bunch on my channel that you can just around, sh not a bunch of root chakras, but ways to create your own shock, your own meditations, particularly around chakras. And also on YouTube, there are so many wonderful, beautiful people offering so many different, um, meditation possibilities. You could just punch in root chakra meditation. It'll, you can find just music. You can find a guided meditation. You can find just frequencies, all kinds of stuff. So perhaps engage that now. And as you engage in your journey, the last card, the last card I'm going to pull is from a deck called divine nature. And again, I sat with the cards already and I asked them, um, to give us a card, uh, for support in processing the information, in your ears, heart and mind heard here, whether you heard the intro and, you know, just the intro and then the, the yin section, or you, uh, went through the entire video and heard the yang and the yin. We're looking for support. What, what info, what insight can be given to folks here to support the information, their ears, heart, and mind heard during this unbinding identity conversation. Again, I'm going to cut the deck in three and take the top card. And it is uh, unmask your darkness. Card number seven, unmask your darkness. Seven might be significant to folks. Unmask your darkness. The dark is so misunderstood, but it doesn't need to be. It is in the darkness that things grow and develop, including you. You are being asked to embrace your darkness as mother. The night of soul has secrets for you and is illuminating truths you wouldn't be able to see in the garish brightness of the known. Poet Mary Oliver talked about a box of darkness being a priceless gift in her life. The chaos, crisis, and suffering want to gift you a new understanding of who you really are beyond who you have thought yourself to be. It is when the dark surrounds us that we come to know ourselves as the light. Hmm. I just got really emotional, Ashe universe, because I think, um, yeah, it's such a beautiful card. One thing I know about this work, and I, I can't remember if I mentioned it earlier, and I'm actually, in my meditation this morning, I realized my next episode for Transmuting the Eye um, needs to be explaining how I connect shadow work to transmuting the eye. And that's what I read here, just in terms of the beautiful, like I find shadow work to be this beautiful process because I think of it as coming into relationship with the parts of me that I have forgotten that have hidden themselves. Um, but they were created to protect me which is such a beautiful thing to protect me because they love me. And, you know, then they either went awry or, um, they, you know, uh, it got misconstrued or manipulated by the world around me, right. By, by oppressive, suppressive, controlling facets of white supremacy, patriarchy, homophobia, um, xenophobia, elitism, environmental racism, like just all this different stuff. And so, um, unmask your darkness, I think is saying 
you know, there's a, a, a place, a, a place, know that you can go within yourself and find the gifts, right? Find the gifts, um, the gift of understanding any chaos, crisis, or suffering that you find there, because it's allowing you to understand who you are beyond what you might have thought if we don't take the time to be in relationship with those parts of ourselves. And it's such a beautiful gift. And I think I'm going to, my heart, my heart chakra is really um, full right now in this really beautiful way because I think that it's landing. I'm hoping that it's landing on uh, anyone who's watching here of how beautiful and amazing you are and that the gift to yourself, like be intentional, create, imagine, foster this journey. It's not a task um, to check off a box to check off. It's not anything that you're forced to do. It has to be something you want to do, right? It's when that it's when the dark surrounds us that we come to know ourselves as the light. So imagine foster, imagine create foster what that journey is. You want it to look like be thoughtful in what you, what intentions you're setting, hold all of this in grace and compassion. Beautiful. Beautiful. I was going to look up um, the number seven in terms of numerology. Seven is knowledge, retrospection, and awareness. Beautiful. Um, I think we are complete. I think we are complete. I want to thank our higher selves because they were definitely present. Um, our ancestors, spirits, archangels, and the light for, um, for the yang of it, for the yin of it, for bringing you here, for bringing me here. Um, thank you for choosing to engage this content. Um, again, uh, uh, and this is actually a note that I wrote earlier. I'm looking at my notes. So I want to make sure I cover everything, but it came up in the reading, but earlier I wrote, please engage, engage grace and compassion as you take this journey. And really any journey, right? Call on any external support if and when you need. Uh, you're not alone. And strength and courage is what asking for support looks like, right? It doesn't mean you're weak by asking for support or calling on others. It actually shows, in our society in particular, it shows a great deal of courage and strength. Um, even as we take these journeys, know that you are worthy, perfect and whole, exactly as you are and exactly as you are not. You know, we take these journeys to remember and regard that more fully, this, that we are worthy, perfect, and whole. We take these journeys to remember and regard this more clearly, fully, and wholly. If you're so inclined, please share, like, subscribe, leave any comments um, as you, your higher self, or your guides so move you. Super grateful that you spent time with me, um, as above, so below, as within, so without, as the universe, so the soul. You are loved. Unfettered and infinite love and gratitude. <laughs>